Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, go. Uh, one of those practical questions, uh, practical questions that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I, try, I try to do some of that class, uh, Oh, uh, somebody emailed me about them. Uh, they get, uh, when I imported the course, apparently it rolled them back to 2013. And so I went in and uh, changed, uh, basically put them up again. Okay. So, so they're there now. <coughs> Okay, in terms of the stuff, is always just bad news. Deadlines, same as been all along. Quizzes part one, deadline five, May 19th. Exam one, quizzes part two, deadline five, May 28th. Exam two, quizzes part three, uh, deadline June 1. And exam three, June 17th. Exam four, quizzes part four, exam four five, deadline five, June 18th. And then the grades all will go in on June 19th. So be sure to complete anything you want to complete uh, before the deadlines. And then for the grades, be sure to check your, your grades on Blackboard uh, before the final grades go in. That way, in case there's an issue, you can email me and, and straighten that out. Because once they're in, they're kind of in. Okay, before pressing on to the new stuff, picking up where we left off last time with the adventure of the argument by analogy, anything about the stuff to be or the stuff that has been or any stuff in general that needs more stuff? Sir? Is the due date the 19th or the 28th? Oh, for uh, which? The first one. Oh, exam, uh, exam one? Or quiz? The quiz. Both. Oh, both. Yeah, uh, quiz part one is uh, May 19th. And then the quiz and the, the exam 28th? Um, yeah, the exam uh, one deadline is May 28th. Because we will finish the section on uh, May 19th. But as I said, you get until the next exam to finish the well, until we finish the next section to complete the actual exam. So you actually you always get like extra time past the section to finish the exam, except for part four, because that's the end of all the, the stuff. OK, anything else? OK, so last time we are looking at arguments with the main purpose of university, of course, for the quizzes and test. Also, of course, for the paper. And thirdly, of course, just for generally useful knowledge. No one argues stuff. Here we saw that arguments essentially boil down to a claim being argued for, known as a conclusion. You have one and only one of those. And then you have the evidence or reasons offered for that conclusion, known as the premise or premises. And they're much like breadsticks, theoretically unlimited. Then we looked at the dis uh, distinction between the deductive arguments and inductive arguments. And we saw that, informally put, Deductive arguments deal in supposed certainty. They're supposed to guarantee their conclusion. Inductive arguments deal in probability. That even if you get an inductive argument that is strong, it may, merely makes it such the conclusion is likely to be true, or probably true, given the assumption that premises are true. And our first one is the analogical argument, or argument by analogy. And as we saw, it basically involves comparing stuff. And we looked at you know, there are some things that are analogies that aren't argumentative, explanatory ones, ones in aesthetics, and of course, rhetorical ones. Now, in normal everyday life, people don't lay out this strict form. That someone normally wouldn't say premise one, premise two, premise three, conclusion. They'd be much more informal about it. But when seeing the structure of an argument, it's always good to see the real structure. So strictly speaking, Here's what an argument by analogy would look like. It's got three premises, although you could smush them down to, to two, and of course a conclusion. And the basic idea is that we're comparing two things and saying that because they're alike in other ways, they're alike in the way we're concerned with. First, the strict form. We've got two things being compared, X and Y, whatever they are. Could be, we could be comparing human beings and rats, or you could be comparing Vietnam and Iraq, or you could compare the United States to the Roman Empire, or we could compare, you know, Ted Cruz to Ronald Reagan, whatever you want to compare. Then we say that X, well, our first thing, has certain qualities, P, Q, and R. And these are just variables. You could put anything in there you wanted to. So we say X has certain qualities. Step two, we establish that thing too, why, has those qualities as well, whatever they are. Then, in premise three, we establish that X 
has the quality we're concerned with. We'll call this <coughs> property Z. And then we conclude because X and Y have these properties in common, bless you, that in X has Z, that Y will have Z as well. Or put informally, these two things are alike in a bunch of ways. This has got this quality Z, so this has got Z as well. To illustrate first a very literal analogy, when companies develop you know, new pharmaceuticals, or back when they would develop you know, lip glosses and oven sprays, they would want to make sure that that stuff doesn't like harm or kill people, because people have lawyers, but animals don't. And so typically they would test on animals. And they'd use an argument by analogy. So suppose we've got you know, this X being, say, laboratory rats, and we test them. We try a new chemical on them, and they get you know, cancer. And then we'd say, well, people are like rats. We're mammals, we get lungs, we get spines, spleens, nervous systems, all that stuff. And if this chemical gives rats cancer, it will probably give us cancer as well. And that'd be a very literal argument by analogy. People are like rats, this gives rats cancer, it'll probably give people cancer as well. Now we can also use analogies for various other, you know, other approaches as well. Not just like literal rats or like people. It's commonly used in philosophy to make a moral argument. So if you want to argue, for example, that something is evil or good, you find something that's already accepted as evil or good and say it's like that. For example, suppose you wanted to argue that war is immoral. You could find something like that. And here's how an analogy could go. Suppose one morning I get up and I gaze across the fence in my backyard into my neighbor's yard and I see that the grass is in fact greener on the other side of the fence. And I decide it's time that I conquer my, my next door neighbor's territory. So I go to Walmart, which is your one-stop shop for neighborhood conquest. How so? They can buy like a riding lawnmower. You can buy a welder to put on the armor plating. You can buy shotguns and ammo. And you can buy, of course, the snacks that are essential to a good ride of conquest. You want some of the little salts, maybe some you know, pretzels. Of course, you need a Gatorade to replenish those important electrolytes, because when you're out conquering stuff, that's kind of thirsty work. And of course, you need a soundtrack. And the best soundtrack for Rise of Conquest is, of course, the Ride of the Valkyries from Wagner. You ever seen Apocalypse Now? The power that bombing the, the heck out of stuff? They always play that. It's kind of a thing. So I assemble my little mini tank with the shotguns on it, take a last sip of Gatorade, maybe a little caffeine or something, roll across my neighbor's yard, destroying them, and claiming their yard for me. Now, would it be bad of me to kill my neighbors and take their land? Yeah, problem. You know, murder, maybe like murder and theft. Now, by analogy, the war would be a similar thing, except instead of going to Walmart to buy stuff, you'd go to like you know, an arms dealer, and instead of maybe a riding lawnmower with some shotguns, you'd get like a tank and some planes and helicopters and stuff. But it seems relatively similar. What makes, you know, my going over and killing my neighbor bad would be killing them and taking their stuff. And war involves killing people and taking their stuff. So you could say by analogy, that would be bad as well. <clears throat> Another example of analogy used in ethics would be something like this. Suppose I walked into the room and I had a really good sandwich, you know, barbecued sandwich. And, and I'm wearing, you know, well, in fact, I have nice new leather shoes and a leather belt. And someone says, ooh, that's a really nice sandwich. And my, those are some snazzy shoes. And that belt, that's nothing shabby either. And I said, well, guess what? Remember those neighbors that are causing me all that trouble? And I went over and you know, killed them because they were annoying. And I thought, well, why let all that meat and skin go to waste? So I made a nice sandwich out of them. Delicious, delicious neighbor. And of course, again, let all that skin go to waste. So you know, I used some of my, my stuff I learned back in you know, uh, home act back in high school to make a nice belt out of them and some nice shoes. Now, of course, killing people and eating them and making belts and shoes out of them would be morally horrifying, the stuff you see in horror movies. But I said, no, no, I'm just joking. The sandwich is, you know, it's, it's um, you know, pork barbecue, and this is just, you know, dead cow on my feet and in my belt. I would say, oh, that's probably okay. But by analogy, you could say if it's wrong to kill any people, it may be wrong by analogy to kill any, you know, cows and pigs.
pigs and stuff. And those would be arguments by analogy. Now, for the paper, you'll be looking at, and we'll see more of this um, next time, looking at a particular analogy by our good dead friend Socrates, in which what he's doing is he's going to compare the youth of Athens, who he supposedly corrupted, with horses in his famous horse trainer analogy. And he doesn't like, you know, lay it out like this, but that's the way the argument is built. He's saying, you know, the youth are like, the youth have the following qualities, horse have the following qualities, the youth are like horses, therefore it's true of the horses, it's true of the youth. And what you have to do in the argument part of the paper is assess the quality of that analogy, which leads to the important and obvious question, how do you tell when you get a good analogy or not? How do you assess it? Well, before going to that, anything about this or barbecue recipes that needs more stuff. Actually, I'm not very good at barbecue. I'm from Maine, and so I'm just kind of faking when I barbecue stuff. I just apply heat to you know, food. Now, fortunately, the assessment to arguments by analogy is pretty straightforward. There are three standards. And so when you're doing the, the argument section of the paper, assessing is first your know, argument with the horse train analogy. The way to do it, you know, to make it very well organized and very straightforward and complete, is you can just sort of tick through each of these three standards, just explicitly. You know. So the strength of an argument by analogy depends on this. First, the number of properties the two things have in common, which is reasonable. If, you, if you're comparing two things, the more they have alike, the more they are alike. And an argument by analogy rests on saying these two things are alike in these ways, so they're alike in this other way. And so the more they're alike, the better. So in the case of the horse trainer analogy, the question would be, do the youth and the horses have enough in common to make it a good argument? And the standard is basically the more stuff they have in common, the better. The less, the worse. Now, of course, even though the number is important, what's also important is how relevant those qualities are to what it is you're talking about, that property Z. To use a stupid example, suppose someone wanted to argue that getting involved in more in uh, the situation in Iraq and Syria would turn out just like Vietnam. And suppose someone said, well, if you look at the names of the country, Vietnam, it's got an A in it. You look at Syria, also A. Look at Iraq, it's got an A. So therefore, Syria and Iraq will be just like Vietnam. Now that is a similarity. It's true, if you check, all three countries, at least in English, blatantly have the letter A. But would that be a good, or good argument? Is having the letter A really relevant? No, it's just coincidence. In fact, many countries have the letter A in them. So we want to see if the quality is relevant or not. Now, the more relevant it is, the better. The less relevant, the worse. So in regards to the paper, you'd ask, do the horses and the youth, are the qualities they share relevant to what Socrates is talking about? To the degree the answer is yes, the argument is stronger. The answer, the answer is no, weaker. So going through, you basically you'd say, how much do the youth and horses have in common? You think it's you know quite a bit, the argument would be stronger. You think it's not that many, you'd say the argument was weaker. And then in regards to the relevance, same deal. More relevant, better argument. If the qualities are not relevant, weak argument. Last thing to consider is whether the two things being compared have any relevant dissimilarities, things that break the analogy. So in the case of the youth and the horses, you'd ask, are there relevant differences between them that break the analogy? Now, of course, we have to consider what would be relevant. Now, it's true, for example, that horses eat hay and the youth don't. It's, all, it's true that horses, you know, have hoofs. Actually, one big, hoofs are supposedly just like one big fingernail. <laughs> But it's true that the youth don't have hoofs. But a question would be is true, those are differences. The youth don't eat hay, uh, they don't run around with four legs, they don't have hoofs, they don't have tails. 
they don't have like big ears, they don't, you know, whinny. Uh, but then the question would be is are those actually relevant differences that break the analogy? Now, there can, of course, be dispute over all three of these, which is why, in case you're wondering, hmm, what is the right answer to the paper? And the answer is, there isn't one. Because since it's an argument by analogy, you could argue reasonably for both sides. You could argue reasonably that Socrates is right, the horse are like the eagle. Or you could argue reasonably, no, I don't buy that analogy. Here's why it breaks down. To give an example of a relevant dissimilarity, we can go back to the um, you know, the barbecue sandwich example. Now, if people are like, you know, pigs, and eating people is wrong, eating pigs would be wrong too. So whether it's people barbecue or pig barbecue, bad. But you could argue that it's okay to eat pigs because there's a relevant dissimilarity. That the usual argument is, is that, you know, pigs are inferior to us, so it's okay for us to eat them. Not okay to eat people, because people have like, rights and they're intelligent and they talk and pigs are just, well, they're kind of smart, but they're also delicious. So you could argue a relevant dissimilarity is deliciousness. And other people, of course, would argue against that, saying what matters is not like being smart, but being able to suffer. And pigs can, can suffer. Okay, so that's the argument by analogy. Now, in addition to its use, you know, philosophically, you know, the horse train analogy, arguments in ethics, it's also very useful across the board. Uh, I mentioned that if you could only have like one argument, eh, you might want to argue by analogy. And I'll give two quick illustrations of how it's useful outside of philosophy. One obvious area of use is law. If anyone is considering an exciting career in the legal field, much of legal reasoning is argued by analogy. For example, what typically you know, occurs in many cases is the use of precedent. The idea is when you're arguing, you'd say, well, you go and look for you know, cases that are like your case and find those that go the way you want your order to go. To go. And then you basically focus on that precedent. In the previous cases, you know, it went this way. My case is like these cases. So according to that legal precedent, my case should go that way as well. So reasoning by precedent and law is arguing by analogy. My cases are like these, it should go the way those would. Another example, medical reasoning. A lot of that is argument by analogy. So if you're considering a career in medicine, it, you go through medical school, and say in medical school you see like an example of poison ivy. And then when you're, you know, have your own practice, someone comes in, they've got, you know, red swelling on their arm, complaining of itching, so they've been out back, you know, at their house, you know, pulling up weeds, you'd say, well, that's very similar to the case of poison ivy I saw in medical school, therefore, by analogy, it's poison ivy. So it's a pretty useful type of argument. So recap, argue by analogy, inductive, you argue by say, saying the two things are alike in certain ways, they're alike in another way. How do you tell when you're a good one? Well, three standards. How much do they have in common? How relevant is it? And are there dissimilarities that break the analogy. To the degree you answer, you know, more, you know, very relevant, and few or no dissimilarities, makes the argument better. To the answer it's, you know, not many, not relevant, and yes, you know, relevant dissimilarities, it weakens the argument. Before pressing on to our next one, anything about argument by analogy that needs more analogy stuff? Another useful argument is the argument from or by example. In terms of whether this would be useful, uh, again, like on the tests and quizzes, of course, and for the paper, you don't have to use an argument by example. You will need to use the argument by analogy, because Socrates uses the horse trainer analogy, which you have to assess, but you might or might not use the argument by example. When you go over the paper, I'll say how this could be useful for assessing his unintentional argument, but it's not actually required that you, you use it. But here's how to, what it is and how to use it. Shockingly enough, an argument by or from example is when you argue by giving examples. 
And the form is basically this. You give example after example, hopefully at least one, preferably more, to support your claim. And then you conclude that since this example supports a claim, this example supports a claim, therefore, conclusion, the claim is true. Now, this can be used in philosophy, of course, clearly. But it's also you know, an argument you can use in everyday life. And give a, a concrete example of its use, I'll turn to, to politics. Now, as you know, we get an election coming up, not this fall, but the fall after the fall, so <laughs> long time. But people are already campaigning. Well, campaign's already going. And one of the questions, of course, that comes up is, is the candidate qualified in foreign policy? And so what the candidates will do is, they'll, when asked about that, they'll try to give examples of their foreign policy experience. And so, you, for example, Hillary Clinton can say, you know, to a Secretary of State, and can give examples of all the stuff that she, she did. And then she would conclude that because of all those examples, she does have foreign policy experience. When um, Sarah Palin, the great political philosopher, was asked about her experience, she supposedly said that she could see Alaska from her house, which she was you know, joking. I mean, sorry, she could see Russia from her house. She lives in Alaska. She could clearly see Alaska from her house because she's in Alaska. But a, you know, a very question would be, would that be reasonable foreign policy experience? Uh, Carly Fiorino, who was formerly the head of Hewitt Packer before she got like fired and stuff, um, she claims as her example that she sat across from the table from Vladimir Putin and she was involved in business. But a fair question would be, are those enough examples of foreign policy experience to be president? And is that example a, a good one? Is that proof of that kind of experience? Now, moving away from politics, you can argue for just about anything this way. For example, if a person wants to establish that they're, you know, honest, they can give examples of their honesty. Or if someone wants to establish that they're experienced in their field. In a way, you can kind of think of your, your resume. When you claim like you've got job experience, you're kind of doing an argument by example. If someone says, do you, do you believe that you are qualified in this field? And you could use an argument by example, giving your experiences to support the claim that you are qualified. So a pretty useful method. But again, very straightforward. You have something you want to support, and you just give example after example after example that supports it. Now, in terms of how this might be deployed in the paper, again, Socrates doesn't use in the harsh trade analogy, the intentional argument, he doesn't use the argument by example. He uses an argument by analogy. But when assessing his unintentional argument, what he claims is basically this, that he knows that if he corrupts people around them, they'll probably hurt him. But he doesn't, he doesn't want to be hurt, so he wouldn't corrupt them. And so the issue is there, could someone corrupt people around them and avoid being hurt by them? And you can argue, of course, either way. If you want to argue that no, a person couldn't do that, you can find real examples where people corrupted those around them and came to a bad end. Or if you think that someone could do it, you can find real examples from history of people corrupting those around them, but not coming to a bad end. And we'll go over in more detail how to do that a bit later. Before moving on to how to assess this, anything about that that needs more stuff? Now, in this case, there are four standards of assessment. First, since an argument by example, more examples the better. So, for example, if you're running for president and claiming that you have foreign policy experience, you want to have a lot of examples to back up your claim. Secondly, of course, the examples have to be relevant. Suppose someone you know, could, can see Russia from their house. Is that foreign policy experience? Suppose someone once say at Olive Garden. Does that count as foreign policy experience? Suppose someone you know, knew someone from Switzerland. Does that count? Suppose someone nego negotiated a treaty with another country. Would that count? Third, the examples need to be specific and clearly identified. 
So a person says, yeah, he did all that foreign policy stuff, you know, foreign stuff, you know, with policy and, you know, experience. And they need to be, you know, identified. Now, just like with the argument by analogy, we need to consider dissimilarities. With an argument by example, you would need to consider counterexamples, which are examples that go against the claim being made. Now, a good question might be, why would you want to consider counterexamples or dissimilarities in your argument? That'd be like, you know, a boxer telling someone, yeah, my left's kind of weak, so punch the left side of my face because you can hit me there. That would seem to be foolish to, you know, consider problems in your argument. But there are actually good reasons to do so from the standpoint of both, you know, logic and also persuasion. From the standpoint of good reasoning, if the goal is to get to truth, you'd want to consider counterexamples because the objective is to get things correct. It's also worth considering because you can actually make your case stronger by considering possible counterexamples and addressing them. Your cases would be both more persuasive, but also would help you know back it up more. And there's also a practical concern. If you know that your audience is going to be aware of counterexamples, it's always better, as they say in politics or damage control, you always want to be ahead of the story, so to speak. It's much, generally much better to handle something in your own terms, to say, here's a potential counterexample, but here's why it doesn't, you know, you know, ruin my argument. Now, kind of the challenge is, in terms of assessing it, is weighing the stuff. You're basically weighing the number of examples, how good they are against each other. And there's a fair question of how much they, they count. To use an everyday example, suppose someone claims that they are honest, and they give examples of their honesty. Well, for all of us, have there been times when we were not 100% honest? Yeah. But the question would be, you know, if we, if we have a standard of, you know, a person who's even told one lie is dishonest, well, then we're all dishonest. And the question to be is, how much do they weigh? So if someone, you know, maybe once when they were like three years old, lied about something to get some ice cream, you'd say, well, you know, that's no big, big deal. Or someone, you know, lied about uh, their weight, you know, <laughs> and someone asked them, no, no big deal. But if someone lied about something, you know, really important, like they lied about having, you know, a medical degree when they're operating on someone and they didn't, then that'd be a little more serious. And so there's a question of how much they, they win. Okay, so that's the argument by example. Inductive, the way you argue is by presenting examples that support the claim being made. The way you tell if you're a good one is based on the number of examples, more the better. Relevance, the more the better. Being specific and clear identified, the better. And counterexamples, which go against it, would need to be considered. It's basically weighing them to see which weighs out the most. Before going to our final argument, the dreaded argument from authority. Anything about example that needs more examples or stuff? <coughs> the third and final one in our trilogy of arguments is the dreaded argument from authority. The idea is this. As we go through life, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And so we often have to rely on the expertise of others in terms of what we believe. And so the argument from authority essentially is built on that. The basic idea formally is we accept a claim as true on the basis of the expertise or authority of the person making the claim. Roughly put, this person is an expert, they say it, so it's true. Now again, since um, we can't be experts on everything, we do have to rely on the expertise of others. And so we have to assess their expertise to tell whether we should believe them, reject their claim, or suspend judgment. Now, can we use a couple ways. One way to use it is just a straight-up argument to try to show that something is, you know, correct because an expert says it. Another way to use it is to use it to basically build an argument of your own, establish, say, like a key claim that you then develop more in your argument. For example. Suppose someone's arguing about the censorship of violent video games and violent movies. 
arguing that whether or not kids should be kept away from the movies of violence, like you know, Avengers Age of Ultron, or violent video games, like pretty much any <laughs> video game. Now what a person could do is they could refer to experts, you know, expert psychologists who claim that say violent video games are harmful, or experts who claim that they're not. You can find experts on both sides. So a person might say, you know, to make something up, they might say, according to Dr. So you know, Smith and Jones, in their landmark 2014 study of violence in video games, they found that children who played more, more violent video games engaged in 22% more acts of personal violence. And then you could argue that, given that violent video games cause violence, we should censor them because it's our obligation to protect the children from harm, something like that. So what's the actual form? Well, pretty straightforward. It's got two premises and a conclusion. Premise one, you establish the person is an authority on the subject. Premise two, you establish the person makes a claim in that subject, and you conclude that claim is true. Now, in normal life, people don't talk like that. You won't hear someone you know, come back and say, I spoke to my, my doctor is an authority on medicine. My doctor said that I had the flu. Therefore, I believe it's true that I have the flu, which sounds kind of like Dr. Seuss. It is true that you have the flu. <laughs> Horton here is uh, who also has the flu. But anyways, enough free verse, back to the stuff. <laughs> so normal people don't argue like that. They would say something like, I went to my doctor, my doctor says I got the flu, and that sort of applied argument from authority. Before going on to how to assess one of these, anything about the this stuff that needs more stuff? Or any more Dr. Seuss? Now this one is probably the most complicated to assess. Basically what you assess it in, in terms of whether the person or source in question is a legitimate authority. Now interestingly, morally enough, there's a fallacy called fallacious appeal to authority, which is when someone doesn't argue from authority, but doesn't meet these standards. Even arguments from authority that are good are still pretty weak, because essentially what you're saying is, this authority says it's true, they're an authority, so it's true. And so you're kind of believing it's true because you're hoping the person got it right. First standard is this. The person obviously has to have sufficient expertise. That, of course, can be problematic because in some areas there are clear standards. Like to be a doctor, you got to go to medical school. you got to go through your internship. Or to be a lawyer, you got to you know, go to law school, pass the bar. And so in some areas you could say, okay, we have clear standards of expertise, certification, degrees, et cetera. But in other areas may not be, you know, certification exams, et cetera. And even if someone does have, say, a degree in certification, they still might not be very good at their, their job. But in general, the first thing to look at is, is the person actually an expert? Do they have the education, the experience required to be considered an expert. Secondly, of course, a person could be a total expert in one area, but people like to talk about all kinds of stuff. And so if the person is speaking outside of his or her field, then the fact that she's an expert in one area doesn't make her automatically an expert in another. For example, if you have someone who's, um, say, an expert at physics, greatest physicist the world has ever seen, and they start talking about politics or ethics. Well, I mean, if they're really, really smart at physics, they're probably pretty smart and can say smart stuff, but being an expert in physics doesn't make a person an expert at ethics or politics. So even though people would tend to listen to them because they're like super famous physicists, the fact that they're not an ethicist or an expert in politics means that their claims should be given no more weight than, you know, a, a non-expert, because that area, they're a non-expert. Another common example, of course, is advertising. When they have pe people selling various <coughs> products, they're not experts typically in those products. For example, I remember when Michael Jordan had the Duracell battery, I think it was Duracell, and he was you know, selling batteries. Now, he's a good basketball player, smart guy, but is he an expert on energy storage technology? 
No. I mean, you know as much about batteries as probably any other normal person. But if I say, wow, Michael Jordan really likes those batteries, so they got to be great, and that'd be kind of bad reason. Now, if he does, if he is talking about, you know, something like he knows a lot about like Gatorade, then believable, because he probably has consumed a lot of Gatorade in his time. So a person's going to be talking in their field of expertise. Now, a person's, you know, experience and qualifications in one area can give them an edge in another. For example, if someone is an expert at, um, you know, physics, they probably do know a lot of math, they learn a lot of math. Or if someone is an expert in, you know, philosophy, they would probably learn quite a bit about causal reasoning. So they could say things about, they say the process of causal reasoning. They may, wouldn't be an expert, say, in like, you know, the particular things that causation deals with, but they could talk about the reasoning stuff. Another important standard is this. If you're dealing with, you know, something controversial, or even non-controversial, there's got to be an adequate degree of agreement among the experts. Why? Well, the idea is this. In, you know, the science or anywhere, kind of the gold standard is this. It's the consensus of the majority of experts in the field. And the reason is, is that the majority of experts are probably going to get it right. Could they be wrong? Yes. Have they been wrong? Yes. But if you're betting, the rational bet is with the majority. I mean, to use a you know, stupid example, suppose you had 100 you know, people who are experts at math, and they're working on the solution to a problem. And suppose 98 of them get one answer, and two people get a different answer. Assuming you, you don't know anything about the math itself, yourself, you're not an expert at it, the best bet would be to go with the 98. They're more likely to be right. Could they be wrong? Yeah. But they're more likely to be right. And so the idea in general is this. The majority opinion of the qualified experts is probably correct. Now, this assumes, of course, that we're talking about something that we're not experts in. So, and if, since we're not experts, we have no way of judging you know, the material itself. So we have to go with the opinion of the majority, which, you know, again, not guaranteed to be right, but it's a rational thing to do. The majority are more likely to be right in regards to the experts, keeping in mind they could turn out to be wrong. But if we're not an expert ourselves, we have no real way of deciding between them, because by definition, we're not experts. Now getting back to you know, Michael Jordan selling like Gatorade or batteries, even if a person does meet the other standards, they're a qualified expert, they're speaking in you know, their field, there's still the question about potential bias. So for example, should you buy Gatorade because Michael Jordan appears in a commercial with Gatorade? No, I mean, he'd know him. I mean, he's an athlete a long time, so he probably knows a lot about Gatorade. I know a lot about Gatorade, too, but no one's going to me, pay me to sell, to sell it. But is he, did he appear in those commercials because he truly, sincerely believes in Gatorade, of bringing the word of the Gator to the people? No, he probably did it because he got a you know pretty sweet check for doing so. And I must admit, if Gatorade came to me and said, hey, you want to use your fame as a philosopher and, and runner to sell some sugary water, we'll give you a million dollars, I'd be like, yes, I would. <laughs> I would totally do that. You know, because it's not going to kill people too much. And, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money. But, of course, in that case, you probably shouldn't believe what I say because I would be biased because Gatorade would be paying me a big stack of cash to say how great Gatorade is. Now, it doesn't mean that someone who's biased is necessarily wrong. So if I was getting paid by Gatorade to say that Gatorade is a good thing to drink, it doesn't mean it won't. It can be, you know, if you're exercising and burning up enough calories, you need those electrolytes, it can be quite, quite good. I mean, I use it even though I don't get paid by, you know, Gatorade. So the mere fact that someone does have a bias doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's something worth considering. To use a concrete example, if you have um, an issue, well, we can take the issue of climate change. Good example of this. My own view on the matter is I'm not an expert in climate science. I took earth science in college for my science requirement, get an A <laughs> in one class on earth science. So I do not consider myself, you know, I know we're on earth and I know it has like water and stuff, 
but I don't consider myself an expert at client. So what I do is go with the opinion of the majority of qualified experts. So since they say climate change is occurring, I say that's probably true. Now, of course, it's worth considering, are they biased? And of course, there are people who claim that climate change isn't occurring. But it's fair to ask, are they biased too? So for example, if someone had huge investments in green energy, solar power, you know, wind power, and they were saying, oh, climate change is happening. You've got to invest, you know, you've got to switch to solar or wind power. Well, then you might say, well, they're a little biased. They get a lot of cash rolling on it. Or similarly, if someone said climate change isn't real, and you see they're being paid by, you know, Exxon or, you know, another oil company, you'd say, well, that could bias them. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but bias is worth considering. Last two considerations. If you go on the, the internet, you can find people who claim to be experts on all kinds of strange stuff. And so it's fair to ask, is that area of expertise really a real thing? Is it a legitimate field? Now, sometimes things start off as kind of, you know, dubious and non-legitimate and then become legitimate, but it's always fair to ask, is that a real thing? And, you know, if someone claims to be an expert at, say, you know, healing crystals, to have their doctorate of crystallology, it'd be fair to ask, did they just make that up, or is that actually a real, a real thing? In that case, the answer would be it's made up. Lastly, of course, the authority has to be properly cited, because the only way you can judge the authority of someone is if you know who he or she is. Now, this is an important concern outside of the class for the following reason. If you, you know, follow the news at all, you probably notice that it's very common to use anonymous sources, to say sources close to the president claim he's going to do this, or sources close to, you know, the head of Facebook says Zuckerberg's going to make the following changes. Now, whenever you have a journalist citing unnamed authorities, it's fair to consider this important point. You're basically doing a double argument from authority. You're trusting in the authority of the journalist to assess the quality of their source. Secondly, you're trusting that the authority that the journalist is citing really is legitimate authority. And you have no way of checking because you don't know who the authority is. So anonymous sources makes a very weak argument from authority. Because again, you're basically saying, okay, I gotta trust this journalist's ability to assess the authority of the expert they're citing, and I don't know who the authority is, so it would be really weak. And that's the thing to consider. Anonymous sources, because of that, you're basically doing kind of a double argument from authority, making it very weak at best. Okay, so that's the argument from authority. Essentially, what it's used for is cases where you need to prove something that is not your area of expertise. The way to do it is basically find the authority, cite what they say, and done. The way to assess it is based on these standards. Is a person really an expert? Is she talking in her field? Is there a consensus among the experts? Is the person <coughs> biased? Is the area you know, real? And is the authority identified? Now, you don't have to use this in the paper. Socrates doesn't use an argument from authority. You don't have to use one. But it could be useful in terms of assessing like the horse trainer analogy or the unintentional argument. Now, of these three, the only one you actually have to use is the argument by analogy, because horse trainer analogy, the other two are useful, but totally optional. OK, so that brings us to the end of the argument stuff. Before heading on to some other stuff, anything about this before we move on? Okay, now we turn to a little history, the origin of Western philosophy. Now we can kind of trace the origin of Western philosophy, not surprisingly, back to the, the Greeks. And much of our terminology, you know, epistemology, etc., comes from the Greeks. Now before philosophy got rolling, we had the influence of the Greek poets. You know, put pretty quickly, here's the idea. Greek poets were 
different the way I think of poets today. If someone asked you to picture a poet today, what would you picture? Yeah, a guy standing on the corner, <laughs> you know, talking about, you know, rhyming about the pain of life, perhaps. Yeah, so I think of a poet as somebody who does maybe some verse, you know, probably smokes cigarettes uh, and other stuff, and, you know, rhymes words. Now, the Greek poets were rather different. Their, the idea was that they wouldn't just, like, do rhyming words about stuff. They would present teachings, not just teachings about, like, how to do poetry, but about everything about history, about military tactics, about science, about religion. And the claim was, and it was an accepted claim at the time, that the poets could teach people all the stuff. Now, one reason why the poets are, and people look at the sophists are important to philosophy is because our good dead friend Socrates, and our good dead friend Plato, were involved in something of a struggle with them. Because in ancient Greece, there are basically three contenders to the claim of who could teach you this stuff. And they were the poets, people like, uh, well, Homer probably wasn't a person, he's more of a made up person, but there are poets who claim they could teach you all the stuff you need to know through poetry. There are the sophists, who also, as we'll see, could claim they could teach you all the stuff you need to know about success, and there were the philosophers. And so those were three competing groups, each claiming to have the real deal. Now, the Greeks had a religious system that was polytheistic. The idea being they had, instead of just one god, you know, god, they had many deities, you know, Zeus, Apollo, Athena, uh, etc. And the Greek poets would present tales of the gods. Interestingly, abhorrently enough, the Greek gods were, well, a good way to put it is they were just like us, except much more powerful. They had all the frailties, vanities, egos, tendency towards violence and lust and adultery that we do. They basically were just like super versions of us with all our horrible flaws. Now, the greatest of the Greek poets, again, probably didn't really exist. He probably was, they, we had the Iliad and the Odyssey, and it's attributed to Homer, there probably really was no Homer. He and other poets put forth this idea of a natural order to the world. And that kind of got the ball rolling in what we now call philosophy and science. Also, interestingly, boringly enough, occasionally poets like Hesiod, for example, would pre present the gods as acting from justice, acting from principles. And so we get kind of the beginnings of the notion of morality as we recognize it. Now, most importantly, there were four concepts of order laid out by the Greek poets that influenced stuff even to that. First, there was the notion of purposeful agents, people and gods doing stuff. Now, of course, we still accept this today. People who are theists, who believe in a god or gods, do believe you know, that people do stuff, and they believe that god or the gods do stuff. And of course, even people who are atheists believe in purposeful agents, namely people doing stuff. Secondly, there is a belief in random, purposeless events, or as we say today, stuff that just happens. And of course, today, we still kind of believe in that because we have those, you know, the same stuff happens, and that basically is a way in bumper sticker form of kind of expressing that view. Now the Greeks famously also had the fates that according to like one Greek myth, they would weave the tapestry of reality. And each of us was a thread in that tapestry. And they of course, you know, knew the thread of our life. And like any thread, it comes to an end. And so the fates would be able to see all that happened. It would be set for us. And the fates were immoral. They were neither good nor evil, they simply were. Now today, of course, we do still talk about the term fate. People say, oh, it was fated to be, or it was fated not to be. But we could kind of, today, look at the fates as being kind of, kind of, loosely, very, very loosely, like the laws of the universe. It's just how things work, work out. So even today, we still have those notions. Purposeful agents that do stuff, like us, 
stuff that just happens. Perhaps there is you know, a system of laws of nature that makes everything occur. And fourthly, as I mentioned, sometimes the gods were presented as acting on moral principles. And now, of course, we have the notion of ethics. And so this led to the development of what we now consider philosophy and science. So what's the path to that? Well, this again is kind of the starting point for that Greek science and philosophy. So how did that get rolled? Well, interestingly and boringly enough, we can bring it back to one particular person and one particular day. Here's how. There is a guy named Thales. He's considered both the first philosopher and the first scientist. Is that really true for real for real? Well, we don't know for sure. Maybe there's someone else who was never recorded that did all kinds of great stuff before. <coughs> One disadvantage of trying to figure out like what happened thousands of years ago is limited records. And we know that we've lost most of the records. So there could be all kinds of stuff happening that we have no idea about. At least until we build that time machine. Now, Thales, his claim to fame, well, one of his claims to fame is this. He, like any great thinker, uh, took advantage of the people who'd come before him. It's like Newton said. If he had, if he had seen you know, uh, further, it's because he stood on the shoulders of giants. And some of the things, when people come in, they build on the past. Now, Thales had access to centuries of astronomical data from the Babylonians. They were wild about astronomy. They kept very detailed you know, centuries of records of observations. And even today, people go back to those observations to, to get you know, information about what was, what was seen back then. I mean, obviously, they didn't have, they didn't have like, you know, telescopes and cameras and so forth. But you can, you can actually, back before there were like city lights blocking everything out, you can actually see a lot of what was going on in the sky. And the Babylonians kept a lot of good records. Secondly, Egypt, developing mathematics and geometry for a very practical reason. Everyone's probably heard about the Nile, the great river in Egypt, and it would flood. You know, that, and basically that was enabled the fertility of the crops because it would you know, bring out all that soil and water. And the obvious problem, though, if you've ever seen like, a really big flood, is it tends to wipe out a lot of landmarks. So if, if you want to know like, where's my field and where's Bob's field, you've got to have a system of geometry to work that stuff out. So you take Babylonian observations, you take Egyptian mathematics, and you take a brilliant guy like Thales, and you combine them. And what he did was he realized that he could predict the next eclipse of the sun. And so he did his calculations, and he predicted when it was going to happen. And he got it right. And that is considered to be, at least in the West, the beginning of philosophy and science. The realization that the world, as far as we can tell, follows a systematic system, and we can approach the world rationally and predict what is to be based on what has happened. And that's the origin of both science and philosophy. And then, of course, he died, and he's still dead today. So what is his major contributions, or what are his major contributions to the philosophy stuff? Well, basically, some of the following stuff. One problem that science has dealt with since Thales, since the beginning, and philosophy as well, is what's called the problem of the one and the many. And the problem basically is explaining how all this stuff works. Now, interestingly, since the time of Thales, people have been looking for, you know, put kind of crudely, what it is that makes up everything, the most basic thing. Now, Thales claimed that it was water. Everyone's probably heard of the classic elements, you know, from Greek mythology, earth, air, fire, and water. And Thales, when he was asked, it's believed that he believed it was water. We don't know for sure why, because we don't have like his writings. We do have some writings from Aristotle which say why. But one thing is this. Water is pretty interesting because water 
can exist as liquid and a gas and a solid within the range of human experience. You know, people, you know, you get ice, you melt that, you get water, you heat it up, you get steam. And so it seems to be able to transmogrify between the states of, of matter, because it can. Also, if living creatures don't get water, they get dumped. And if you dig in the ground enough, you find water. And also, if you evaporate water, I mean, this is before people have microscopes, when water evaporates, it leaves behind a residue. Now, we know that it's, what's leaving behind is in the water, but before they had microscopes, it was believed that the water would turn into solids, which was not a stupid hypothesis. It, it matched the observations. And so Thales believed the world is water. Another pre-Socratic, a good dead friend, Her Heraclides, said the world is fire. It's a constant change. Speaking of change, <laughs> oh, going to problem one, one of many. Again, the problem there is what makes up everything. And Thales believed everything was water. Now, today, do we believe that? Do we believe that everything is water? No, because we know that water itself is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. But scientists and philosophers are still trying to find that. You might have heard of the um, Hadron you know, Super Collider. They're look, looking for the God particle. And scientists are still trying to find what is the thing that makes up everything. And the way you find that is you keep breaking stuff until you find the one thing that cannot be broken. And that's the thing that makes up everything. And so what began with Thales is still going <laughs> on today. Thales had his eyes, it's a paper, and we have a billion dollar super collider but we're still working on the same problem. What is the one thing that makes up everything? Of course, we should keep in mind, maybe it's not just one thing. Maybe it's like a lot of things. Second problem, speaking of Heraclitus, is the problem of permanence and change. How is it that things stay the same and how do they stay the same? And Thales addressed that problem as well. So, what are some of the important contributions of our good dead friend Thales? Well, again, first, as far as we know, he started Western science, Western philosophy. So a pretty good resume, you know, uh, item there. First thing, he presented what we now regard as the first known form of monism. What's that mean? Well, basically this. Going back to what we were talking about, um, you know, about ontology and dualism and etc. One question is, is how many basic kinds of stuff are there? So if you were to break the reality and universe down to its simplest parts, keep breaking until you reach the unbreakable, how many things would, be, would you be left with? If you're a monist, you believe you, there's one. There's just one ultimate type of thing. If you were a dualist, you believe there's two. And I gave the example last, in the previous time. The typical dualist believes, you know, body, soul. Thales, though, was a monist. He believed there's just one type of stuff. Now, he's also regarded as being the first materialist. What you saw before. If a person's a materialist, in the philosophical sense, it doesn't mean they like cars and, you know, big houses and champagne, it means they believe that all there is is physical stuff, matter. Most scientists today are materialists. If you ask them about like, you know, angels or spirits or ghosts, etc., and they typically say no such thing. It's all matter. Two other important contributions. One is he put forth a pretty good case as to why theoretical understanding, as opposed to just you know practical you know, approaches, do matter. The idea, you know, put in kind of rubber sticker terms, the idea of the value of knowledge for its own sake. And next, he also, rather than simply appealing to tradition or authority, he went forth to find out answers on his on his own. And that's kind of a hallmark of you know, progressive science and philosophy. Rather than simply believing what one is told, going to see if it's actually true. 
And that's what's really driven science and philosophy since day one. And then, of course, he died and he still did today, but we're still talking about him long after his death. So he does have a kind of immortality. Before moving away from Thales, anything about Thales that needs more stuff? And it's a little water for Thales. Thank you, Thales. Thanks for inventing water. Now, philosophy in the West really got going in the city of Athens, which not Athens, you know, um, Ohio, <laughs> but uh, Athens, Greece. Now, this time period which philosophy was really going was kind of a golden age. The city of Athens was the top of its game. It was engaged in, you know, um, you know vast trade in the region. It was a center of science and learning and culture. In many ways, we are the Athens of our time. You know, we're the leading economic power, we're a center of science, etc. And of course, Athens eventually fell, as do all things. Now, of course, it was also an age of iron, because even though Athens was the top of her game in terms of you know cultural flourishing, economics, etc., there was also some cultural problems, namely the usual stuff that we see in every culture that's at the top of its game. So what were the causes? Why were these social problems? Well, first, and this will sound very familiar, because it's exactly what's going on now. Because yeah, history just keeps repeating itself. And as the historians say, it's because no one listens the first or second or thousandth time. First thing was this. There, you'll hear people still lamenting about it today the decline of traditional authority. And even now, if you turn on you know, the radio or TV or the interwebs and listen to pundits or politicians, they'll talk about how the reason why everything is so crappy is because we just don't follow traditional values. And they were saying this back in ancient Athens, and they're still saying it today. But in a way, it's true. When you have traditions that have been around for a while, when they start getting rejected and replaced, that does create social instability. Like in the United States, we had you know, long-standing traditions about social class, about race, about gender, about marriage, and those have been overturned. For, the, for example, the idea that a, the role of a woman is to be in the kitchen making her man sandwiches has changed. That was the tradition. But if today, if someone tells a woman to go stay in the kitchen making a sandwich, that could end very badly. Hint, probably not with a sandwich. <laughs> and that was a, you know, that's a change. And people, do, you know, people are upset about that. And even today, they're decrying the change of values, that women are not in the kitchen making men with sandwiches. People are upset about the change in marriage. Marriage used to be a man taking ownership of a woman, making her his property. That's old school marriage. Uh, now, marriage is a bit different. And people are mad about that. And so we do see that. We see today and then a decline in traditional authorities. Things change. And it's going to happen, you know, 100 years hence. People will be complaining about how things have changed since our time. Secondly, the relativism I mentioned before. The idea that truth, morality, etc., values are relative to the culture. Now, one thing that fueled that was Athens, you know, was a trading culture. So they had a lot of interaction with the rest of the, the region. And what people naturally thought was, well, there are all these different cultures. Who's to say who's right? There was a famous um, Greek historian, Herodotus, considered the father of history. And he argued that custom is the king of everything. People just believe what they grew up with. And he argued for relativism. And if your culture encounters a lot of other cultures, one response is, of course, sort of you know jingoism, where a person just says they all suck, we're the best, you know, screw those guys, or sort of the view, well, maybe we're not super special after all. Of course, on the downside, if people start grabbing relativism, we see that people embrace ethical relativism and say, well, there really is no truth, which has got a price too. Athens at this time was also somewhat democratic which meant that male property owners could vote. 
which today sounds you know, pretty restrictive, but in a time when there was no democracy, people being able to, even anybody being able to vote was actually a pretty radical change. There was also individualism, the idea that the individual should essentially advance themselves. Now, if we, come to, if we leap forward you know, a couple thousand years to today, same deal. We get democracy, we get individualism, and all the problems that those entail. There is also the rise of skepticism. Why? <laughs> well, even during that time, in the beginning of philosophy, people are like, you know, they'd be you know, out in the marketplace, they're gore up, you know, buying stuff, and they would hear, you know, philosophers argue about this and that, and a person who is reasonably well-educated would say, well, hell, Daly says it's all water, Heraclitus says it's all fire, this other dude says it's all earth, that guy says it's all air, that guy says it's all four, that guy says it's something else, it's all an illusion, so how do I know? And a natural response is, of course, skepticism, to doubt things. Also, one big change was people being very practical about things, focusing on the here and now, which is something we do today, which affects our society in many ways. Now, lastly, when Athens became a democracy, that meant that political power was not so much inherited. You didn't get to be ruler because, just because your mom or dad was a ruler, but you gained power by swaying the masses, by getting them to vote for you. Now, our system works like that as well. The way that you get power in the United States, unless you're a Bush or a Clinton, in which case you just kind of get some warning to it, that you have to sway the masses through persuasion. And so in many ways, we're a reflection of Athens, which is not surprising because if you have similar circumstances, you get similar stuff, which is why history is important. Don't tell the people in history I said that, but that's why history is important. Now, we're heading towards our good dead friend Socrates and Plato. And again, Plato is considered sort of the greatest figure in philosophy, so we're heading to his backstory. Before that, though, we have to get to his other nemesis, the Sophus. Now, in this city of Athens, in this culture of you know, gold and irony and so forth, there arose the Sophus. Now, we know that, of course, you know, from philosophy that Philo means love, Sophia means wisdom. And the Sophus, you know, remember, like, why are they called philosophers? Why are they called Sophus? Well, here's why. The hallmarks of being a sophist are these. First, skepticism. The sophists were motivated by and embraced skepticism, the idea that we can't know. Secondly, they also embraced relativism, that since we can't know what's truly true for real, what we go by is what the culture says. Now, the sophists basically had two main approaches in regards to, you know, ethics. One approach was this. There is no truth in ethics, but the foolish masses have all these beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong, and their traditions, so what you need to do is act or, or appear to act in a way the masses would approve of. So basically, they would teach people to fake, you know, how to basically fake ethics to appeal to the masses. Because again, the, the, the Soviets believe there really is no moral truth, so there's no moral truth. The masses aren't right or, or wrong, they just believe what they believe. But if you want to hold power, you've got to be able to appeal to their prejudices, their values, and their biases. You've got to be able to pander to the masses. Now, to be cynical, we still see this today. If you run for office, you would, and you have money, you would hire people to teach you how to sway and appeal to the masses. And some people can be sincere. Maybe they really believe what they're saying. But of course, you, in order to get elected, you need to sway the masses. You need them to believe that you think the way they do. The second type of, rel second type of approach by the sophists was this. Same view. There is no good or bad, right or wrong. 
But what you should do is have the appearance of being good as far as the masses are concerned, but then do whatever it takes to be successful, to do all the, what people think of as terrible things. And again, if we look at politics kind of cynically, we, we see that. People will say one thing, you know, when on camera, and then we find out about all this corruption and stuff in the background. And they're not very good at their job, because if they're really good at being corrupt, we'd never know. Now, why do that stuff? Well, the sophists, being skeptics, they say, well, it's no truth. Being relativists, they say, well, everything is relative to your culture, because it's no truth. And then the problem is, of course, you still get 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to fill up. So what do you do? Well, the sophist says, what matters is success. You know, there's no good, there's no truth, none of that stuff matters, it's all nothing. So what do you do? Become a success. How do you become a success? Well, in a democracy, you become a success by swaying and pandering to the masses, and they will give you power and gold and so forth. And so what they would do is they would teach people how to be successful. Now, we still have the same thing today. There are people who will happily take your money purporting to teach you how to be a great success. And so sophists are alive and well. How do you tell if someone's a sophist? Well, <laughs> this is kind of a hallmark. If they have, you know, a good sophist will never tell you they're a sophist though. But if they're skeptical, they have relativism, and they believe all the matters of success, and they're willing to say whatever it takes to sway or persuade, then they would be a sophist. They can be hard to spot, of course. Now, thanks to Socrates, being called a sophist is an insult. For example, I uh, write for a couple of blogs, and I have a, many nemesis who like to get on there and you know, put on some hate. But their hate makes me strong, for real. That's why when people say horrible things, I'm like, thank you. Every hateful word just makes me that much more, you know, more inclined not to give up. And so I guess it doesn't work like they hope. And what they do, their favorite thing is, when they're not swearing at me, is to accuse me of being a sophist. And so it's considered a dire insult to a philosopher, which is why they do that. So thanks to Socrates, sophism is now considered kind of a bad word. But, as we'll see, the sophists were fairly important. Next to last thing, the sophists made a useful and interesting distinction between what is called nomos versus physis. Here's the distinction. Physics, of course, is not, you may be wondering like, hey, guy's got a PhD, but he can't spell physics? What's the deal with that? <laughs> is that a real PhD? Uh, well, no, this is, this is the correct spelling for physics. Well, at least not, it's not in the Greek, but it's the correct, I guess, English spelling of it. This is, of course, what I mean by physics. And nomos is where we get our term normative. So the sophists made a distinction between areas of value, judgment, and areas we consider to be sort of the science, objective reality. And so they got that distinction between fact and value started up. Now, there is, of course, considerable debate about whether values can be facts. And it's a debate about whether value is objective or not. The sophist thought, you know, if you ask a sophist, um, so you're a sophist. Do you doubt that if you jump in a volcano, you would like hurt really bad, then you'd die? And they'd say, well, hell no. <laughs> I'm not going to jump in a volcano. So their doubt wasn't typically about the stuff of, you know, the physical stuff. So the sophists, except those who were like extreme skeptics, didn't doubt, you know, that jumping in a volcano would hurt or that eating rocks would be a bad idea. But they believed that all the stuff dealing with nomos, all the stuff about value, was relative, was unfounded. And we still have this notion today. Even now, people say, yes, there's the science stuff, but all that other stuff, art, ethics, politics, law, is just made up stuff, BS stuff. And that's one of the gifts of the sophists, that distinction. So why were the sophists important? Well, one, of course, they gave a way to insult people, calling them sophists. Secondly, they had a huge influence on Socrates and Plato. Much of the work of Plato was in response to the sophist. So they were his good enemy, that 
really motivated him. Now, they also made other important contributions besides really getting Plato going. They developed logic, grammar, rhetoric. They also, again, laid out these problems of skepticism, relativism, and did actually contribute quite a bit. So history perhaps would have been worse off without the Sophists. And they're still around today, often writing uh, success books and self-help books. Okay, now we get to our first main uh, dead guy, Socrates. A little background for Soc, as he liked to be called. He was born in 470 BC, died in 399 BC, and of course is still dead today. We even have you know statues of him, so we have an idea. We think they're really of him, so we do know what he, he looked like. Now, one of the things we'll see about Socrates when we get to the Apology is that one of his signature quotes is that being wise is knowing you know nothing. Now, one thing that kind of got Socrates to Socrates is a friend of his went to the Oracle of Delphi. If you saw the movie 300 and they had you know, the, the weird mutant guys and stuff, uh, that was about the Oracle. Did they have mutants? Uh, no. But the Oracle worked like this at Delphi. You'd go to the Oracle, which is a temple, and you would ask a question presumably and pay some money. And there'd be an oracle, a woman, who would claim to commune with the gods. And she would issue a cryptic statement in response to the question. So it's what people used before we had you know, the Google. And the oracle existed for about a thousand years. So it had a pretty, pretty successful run. You can still, they don't, the oracle's no longer, you know, there's no more oracles there. But you can go to the place where it was. There's ruins there, so if you want to visit Delphi, you can see the ruins. So his friend goes to the oracle and says, Oracle, you know, who is the wisest of men? And the oracle says, Socrates. Socrates is the wisest of men. So his friend runs back and says, Sock, dude, guess what? Sock's like, what? And he says, the oracle says, you are, he says, guess what? Who's the wisest of men? Sorry, you know, if we're like, knock on the knock on the door. <laughs> but he said, you know, Socrates, you're the wisest of men. And Sock was like, hmm. Now, most people, if they were told they were like the wisest or the bestest or the beautifulest, they would be full of pride. And, but Socrates thought about it. He said, well, I don't seem to know a lot. I'm just, you know, just a guy. Walk around Athens without any shoes, talking about stuff. Surely I can't be the wisest of, of people. And so what he set out to do was disprove the oracle, which is important because, as we'll see, that's what gets him killed. Now, one problem is knowing who the real Socrates was. Why? Well, Socrates believed that philosophy was for talking. He didn't actually mean he could write, as far as we know, but he didn't write stuff down. So what we know about Socrates' views, or what we think we know, comes from his student Plato. Plato claims that his dialogues are him literally writing down what Socrates said. Now, in the case of the dialogues that are written early on, which may be dialogues later in the life of Socrates, the experts on this think that that's probably genuine Socrates, probably real Socrates. But as Plato got older, and you know, really older, and was writing more of these dialogues, it's believed the Socrates of those dialogues is not the genuine Socrates, because the views seem to reflect Plato's changing you know, views on things and his more developed, more sophisticated views. So we don't know for sure what the real Socrates believed because we don't have any of his writings. We're just going by Plato. Now we do know or believe that Socrates was up against the sophist. In fact, he, he jokes that he took an incomplete course because he didn't have the money for a full course, but he spends a lot of time arguing against that particular folk. Now, he saw his mission as basically defeating ignorance. He thought the greatest evil of all was ignorance, to believe that, that one knows when one does not. Now, to help people with this, he developed the famous Socratic method. 
everyone's probably heard the phrase because it's used, you know, people talk about it in business, psychology, etc. And a good question is, so what is the genuine Socratic method straight from the, so the, the Socrates? Well, here's how it works. <laughs> One aspect of it, which will take us through the end today, is a method of questioning. Salk is known famously for his dialectic, which is basically, you know, literally going with die, you know, conversation between two people. And the, the Platonic dialogues, for, of which the Apology is one, they're written very much like plays. If you, if you looked at a play, they have the characters, you know, in their lines, and the same thing happens to dialogues. You have a character like Socrates talking like Glaucon and so forth, and presenting their, their views. So here's how the method of questioning would, would go. It typically opens with Socrates encountering someone just going about their business. The person could be on their way back from a festival, or they could be on their way to a trial, or they could just be hanging out talking about stuff. But then, of course, matters quickly turn to philosophy, quickly turn to an issue like what is justice, or what is virtue, or what is beauty. Now, Socrates pretty consistently follows this pattern. What will emerge is a key concept that needs to be defined. So, for example, they might be discussing art, and what might come up is beauty. The person's talking about the word beauty this, beauty that, or virtue. And so Socrates will ask for a definition. What, is, what does this concept mean? And he'll profess you know, ignorance, he doesn't know what the person means, and confusion about it. So Socrates basically said, I'm not sure, you know, this is term, we need to define it, I'm not sure what it's meant by it, I don't know what it is, I'm confused by it. And so what the person will do is very confidently define it. They'll say beauty is this, justice is that, virtue is this other thing. And they're very confident, they think they know it all. And then Socrates will politely thank them and ask for clarification. He says, let's you know, say, like, oh, that's very good, but I have this question. What about this? What about this? What about that? And so the person will give a new, better definition, and then it'll go through that cycle. Socrates will say, well, let's thank you for that, but what about this? And the person will reply back, and he'll say, but what about that? And this will just keep repeating, you know, basically a rinse, rinse uh, or wash, rinse, repeat type of deal, until eventually the person realizes that their confidence was misguided. They came into it thinking they knew what beauty was, or justice, or virtue, and they realize they don't know. And this ends in one of two ways. One, the person says, gosh, look at the time. Gotta go. See you later, Socrates. The other is they say, wow, thank you, Socrates. I'm going to hang out with you some more, and we're going to talk some more stuff. So next time, we will go on to more Socrates, and more Socrates, and then more Socrates.
Oh no, it's um, it's on a uh, particular part of the apology where uh, Socrates is addressing the charge and he's the view in response to the horse analogy and the intentional argument. Yeah, and so the goal of the paper is in part two is to summarize that. Part three is assess his arguments. We, had, we actually haven't gone over how to do the paper yet. So if you want to get a head start, you go on our blackboard and go to the paper section. There's three videos about the paper, a short videos. And then there are there's the uh, paper guide, which goes through step by step how to do the paper. And also, starting um, tomorrow, um, we'll go over um, exactly how to do the paper. Okay. But if you want to jump start on it, it's like I said, there's, there's videos uh, in the paper guide uh, section plus the actual PDF paper guide. Okay. This is also my first day in the class. I just enrolled yesterday. And I was just making sure that. Oh, did you, get, did you um, sign in? Well, I didn't see my name, so I just wrote it. I wrote it in on one of these. Okay, yeah, well, I, yeah. I'll go on. Um, I rather for Chanel's attendant. Okay, thank you. Yours. And what day is the paper due? Um, the paper is due.